Welcome to Eco Ask Why, a podcast that dives into industrial manufacturing topics and spotlights the heroes that keep America running. I'm your host, Chris Granger, and on this podcast, we do not cover the latest features and benefits on products that come to market. Instead, we focus on advice and insight from the top minds of industry because people and ideas will be how America remains number one in manufacturing in the world. So welcome to EcoSY. Today we're having a fun hero conversation and we're sitting down with Mr. Joe Barton. And Joe is the IT plant site lead for Merkin Company. Welcome, Joe. Hey, thank you. Very excited to have you here today, sir. And thank you for taking the time with us on EcoSY. I'd love to get these episodes started, Joe, just by giving our listeners an, an idea of your personal story and your journey to, to where you're at now. Well, I first started with Merck 34 years ago as a lab chemist. When I graduated from Virginia Tech, I actually worked for uh, Dan River Mills for six months in the textile field. And then I moved to Merck. And one of the things I learned early in terms of my journey was need to be a strong company because Dan River at the time, the first week I was there, one of the technicians there says, um, are you still here? And I said, what do you mean? She said, well, we just laid off 200 people. We thought you were going to be the next one on the list. So the I one in Danville there. Yes, exactly. Okay. That's the one in Danville. Yeah. So I learned pretty quickly. I needed to, I needed to find a job that was a little bit more stable than what I had. So I, uh, Got employment with Merck back in 1986 as a chemist here in Elkton, Virginia, and worked um, there four or five years as a chemist. I learned quite a lot there in terms of how we did manufacturing as well as how laboratory learned the whole process, much more than I would have got at Dan River. And then at that point, it was interesting, me as an IT uh, lead now versus where I was back in 86. In 86, when I came off site, there were only eight PCs on the site. And they used them more of, I don't say as a toy, but as a, you know, they didn't know what to do with them. They had them and they just kind of they either had a spreadsheet at the time, maybe, maybe it was Lotus or whatever. And that was about it. We actually started in the laboratory. I did, started working with data acquisition. And that's really how I got my footprint into the IT is actually collecting data. And then from from there, we actually started to develop the IT at the site. And years later came automation. And I saw that my journeys carried me all the way through from the beginnings where there really wasn't anything to a point now where almost everything is connected. And so uh, over the 30 some years, I've seen a lot of different changes. Uh, it used to be used to have a lot of islands of IT. We'd have a little network here and we'd have a little network in this building, a little one in this building. Well, now everything's interconnected. It's all standard. And now the automation is getting into the uh, same realm of they still have some islands of automation, but they're not start- they're now starting to get connected into the process areas where before they were completely isolated. Nobody really knew about the data or knew what to do with it, even how to collect it. So... Wow. All right, Joe. Now, that was a lot. So let me unpack it. Just make sure I got everything. So Virginia Tech first, you know, go Hokies. So good job there. Mm-hmm. Now from the lab chemist, when did you make, the, how did you make the transition from that to IT? Cause I, that's not a natural uh, progression. I, at least I don't see that. So wh- how did that well, come come to be? Well, if you look at what I was, what I was talking about is we, we started in a lab with data acquisition. So we had systems that were totally isolated, whether that be HPLC system uh, that just collected data on a, it was called at the time, it was basically an integrator. And we had to weigh samples on a scale. And we had to do all of those calculations manually. And the chemists would sit there, they would run their data one day, and then the next day, they'd spend all day calculating everything manually. And us and we were looking at this, at least I was, and I said, this has got to be a better way than doing this. So I took it upon myself to actually develop automation to collect the data from the integrator as well as a scale and put it into a, a system 
where the chemist can come up and just have all those calculations done. They would just put in the sample IDs and whatever, and the, the weights would automatically transfer every time they would weigh a sample, and then it would spit out an actual report. And, I mean, we probably eliminated a, one FTE of time per year just doing that, given the fact of how much. And so that's how I got my footprint in IT, because at the time, there were no networks. There were really, like I said, just eight PCs. We had one of them in the lab. We started with an ARCnet network, which is a precursor to Ethernet and token ring and started that process. And as that network organically grew throughout the site, because people were starting to see what we were doing, and they wanted to actually be a part of that and see how that worked. Wow. Okay. So literally eight PCs and then growing, obviously now everything is connected. Now I am curious on, on the automation piece. You said that automation, when it started with, it was a little bit of an island and you know you had these pockets of automation but now that connectivity has come you know to the forefront so maybe how, can you explain that process how did it get started because i know a lot of our listeners are on that journey right now from trying to connect processes and data and automation just just curious on what were there some areas that you focused on to get that started well i think a lot of the areas that are across the plant site we have areas that we actually do batch process and we have areas that we do continuous process. And, and some of those areas were connected with, you know, I remember one of the first PLCs that we had was a G Fanuc PLC. And that actually ran our, one of our uh, fill lines for a very, very long time at the site and was recently replaced a couple of years ago with a Adam Bradley PLC. But, and then other areas that were batch, they would have a system in there, one of our oldest systems is a Provox system where they put in back in the 1980s and it was pretty much isolated. And recently we've connected it to get it to work. But back then, a lot of the products, you just did not have the connectivity because there were no standards at the time. There were, like I said, I was using ArcNet. There was Token Ring. There was Ethernet. Most people were just using direct IO, whether it be serial, RS-232, whatnot those are the things that they were actually using to move things across and then those things were pretty slow and and how much data could you get what could you do with it and a lot of things were just hardwired uh, that way to you know i remember our mrp system was an hp 3000 it had phone wire running up to a vt100 terminal and that was basically what you had in order to work with so as far as distributed data moving things back and forth technology just wasn't there and so now i think the vendors are getting a lot more technology and built in their products to be able to do the connectivity where 20 years ago uh, you didn't see that in fact even in the late 90s until windows nt came along there was still you still didn't have a lot of that common ground you needed you needed some foundation in order to build off of and until we had ethernet as a standard pretty much standard use worldwide until you had NT as a standard or a Windows standard of some sort to where you can have a platform. Uh, nobody knew what to build for. Right. I mean, we had we had actually Novell Netware as a, a networking platform up until the late 90s because uh, Novell came out a little bit earlier than Microsoft in the land space. And, and we were in with that a while until – NT came along. So that's what I'm saying. A lot of it was just technology driven, which you just didn't have it at that time. Yeah. And I mean, those stand this, the way the standards evolved, that gave you, like you said, that same sheet of paper, that platform to work towards. And then that allows all this integration to happen and expansion. So I mean, that's a great story. I mean, that, that is definitely inspiring. And, and You've seen a lot of change over the years coming from eight PCs to, to where you're at now in a, in a major pharmaceutical, but what are you seeing as some headwinds potentially in the future as you as you continue to grow? I know demand's increasing and trying to get OEE up and quality, particularly in the pharmaceuticals world, is that's a whole different level of standards there. So just curious on what may, potentially is some headwinds you may be facing. Well, with, with anything with... Um just in my nature of the business that I'm in and dealing with, you know, we deal with compliance and like I say a lot, 
a lot more of our systems are automated now. So a lot of the data is electronic where it was manual. Getting rid of paper is probably the biggest thing that I'm that's happening at it's happening at a lot of our other sites. It's going to be happening at our site in the very near future is the actual elimination of paper and doing everything electronic. People are not used to doing a lot of that, but it's coming to the point to where everything was going to be electronic. I think that's a big thing. It's going to change. And that and that's going to be a struggle too, because I remember back in the nineties when people, we would actually have classes for for people to learn how to use a PC because they just didn't know how. Today, we expect a person coming out of college to know how to use a PC. We don't have any training for them anymore other than just going online and look at look up something. But then now going electronic paperless and how to deal with the different systems and whatever and understand, I think that's going to be a, a little bit of a struggle for people because it's the next, the next piece for us moving forward. And then what's the driver behind that, Joe? Why, why, why the push for the paperless as an initiative? A lot of it's compliance driven to where when you mark something on a piece of paper, is that what you said it was or did somebody else do it? It's more of a regulatory type thing. But it, but at the same time, it is an evolution, too, because a lot of the systems now, you know, will provide a PDF, electronic copy of a PDF or report or whatever, where before you'd have to look at the date on the screen and copy it to a piece of paper because you'd have to have it for to release product or something like that. So that's the big difference in how to manage that. A lot of that is going to require a lot of infrastructure to make that work because, like you said, when you say talking about the uh, ITOT, a lot of the systems are, have to be connected directly even down to, say, a microscope that you got set in a lab somewhere. It's got an image on it. How do you get that image? Well, you got to connect it up and you got to pull the image. What do you do with it? You know, how do you manage it? How do you maintain it? Those type of things. You know, a lot of just kind of evolves into work that you didn't expect to happen before. One of the things I think is kind of interesting is the, and it's not necessarily it can happen anywhere, not just necessarily where I'm at, but is using cameras in a lot of different places. I've never seen the explosion of cameras that we have on our site, not only just for security, but for a lot of things. What about if you have a pipe leak somewhere? Do you have a camera there that can monitor that? Things that you wouldn't think of before people are coming up with. And all of that requires IT infrastructure and how to manage your data and those type of things. Exactly. And I mean, Joe, we, we've recorded several episodes and that are, that are out there and we talk about IT, OT convergence and, you know, OT networks and, and meeting business goals and the IIOT, you know, all these buzzwords that are out there, but, but you're in it. I mean, <laughs> when you talk about cameras, that is an OT type network device, but you got to get that data right to use it. So maybe talk to us about that evolution from a, OT to IT, how, how is that working for you all? Well, part of it is, you know, you got to have the right people looking into this. I, you know, a lot of times a person may come into the group or may, that we'll interview and, and they'll say, you know, they want to do programming. Well, in my type of work, I don't do that much programming because we have so many systems that we have to maintain and, and for manufacturing, they're already coming prepackaged. It's the integration and putting them together and getting that data from A to B in a fashion that is compliant as well as meeting the need of the customer. Those are the things that, that we are working towards and making that happen. And, and like I say, that is to me the, the pieces that I look for in, in terms of people and how and how to make this work. Got you. Okay. So the integration that, that, and I guess, so, so having those standards in place, I mean, is that kind of facilitating a lot of this change for you to give you a, a nice sheet of music to work from, uh, from an implementation standpoint? Oh yeah. You got to have standards. I mean, if we walk back 25 years ago, we had three, two divisions off site. One had token ring. The other one had ethernet. How do you think we integrated the two divisions? We really didn't. You had some routers in between trying to move data. 
And of course, the one set, one division had one type of email system, the other one had another type of email system. So without the standard, things could not move forward and evolve and work together to do things. I mean, I've I've seen where that has eliminated where we have standards and, and those standards have migrated to other sites to where all the sites have the same standards. So when I talk to somebody, say, in Ireland or in the Asia Pacific region, everybody's talking the same language. And that really helps in terms of trying to get things done. Now, a lot of different areas, we have different requirements for different manufacturing. Maybe we're doing different products, but a lot of those basic principles are still in place. Right. That's great. Thank you. Thank you for walking us through that, Joe. That's wonderful. And and Joe, for for the listener out there that maybe is they're, they're early in their career and they want to get started and or would like to look into this IT space and how OT is now connected, what advice would you have for them out there? Um, be able to accept change because it constantly is changing. Be flexible in what you're doing. Don't cut yourself short or limit yourself to what you're doing. I mean, I know in my career, just As being a chemist, I could have been a chemist for the rest of my life, but there were other things going on that I saw that that were on the I was trying to get on the leading edge or try to get moving forward with that. IT was one of them. And I think for people coming out of college today is looking for that flexibility. You know, there's multitude of different ways to contribute, whether, yes, there are there is programming. There's also integration. There's also business analysts where you should try to design how to do things. A lot of times people, they have a theory to what or something they want to do, but they can't implement it because they have no idea how to get the nuts and bolts done. And I think that's that's a lot of it's what's missing. And then I think the final thing is, and it's kind of, it's one that, you know, you don't think about a lot, especially in IT, but it, it's, not just the communications on the Ethernet wire, but it's the verbal communications or the written communications that the person is doing. How do you communicate with that customer? And can you communicate with them effectively in order to get the right message, right understanding, and getting the right product delivered to the customer? Right. Now, have you seen that? I mean, communication is important. Are you seeing that getting better with the work, the new workforce, or is that a hurdle? Is that a challenge from a communication standpoint? I'm just curious your take here on what you're seeing. I see younger people that I've worked with come in. I mean, the ones I've worked with pretty much, you know, they're some of them are have to, I guess, understand how to do that. They've never been put in an environment where you have to work through some of those goals. I mean, I, it was interesting that some of the communication I saw, and this was at one of our sister sites, it was an NC State grad. Uh, the lady, she was actually was in senior year. Well, she was working in automation, but she didn't have the basic understanding of how Ethernet worked. What is an IP address? You have to have some of those basic understandings in order to be able to communicate to somebody effectively how you want to do something. And until she learned some of the basic tenets or the the basic standards that are out there work, it hindered her from being able to effectively communicate what she wanted to do and how to do it. Now, was that just an oversight in like her training that she had? I mean, or is it just the uh, fundamentals that sometimes we forget and overlook or don't spend that time getting that groundwork? Yeah, and I think I think part of it is just how the – if you go to – and I may be speaking out of turn because, like I say, I haven't been in school for a while, but I don't know of any engineering school that actually has, an, like say, an automation degree where a person that's coming out of the school can can learn how to integrate. Industrial engineering was the closest thing that I saw in tech a few years ago that may, Virginia Tech, that might have that. Otherwise, a person that comes out is really either in the programming space or a chemical engineer that, that has the basic background in terms of 
thermodynamics, synthesis, those type of things, but not understanding how manufacturing works, let alone how to automate or what would the automation look like in a factory. I mean, a lot of most of all of that is learned on the job. Right. And that's that's something that, you know, I don't see, you know, I still don't see a person coming out. I see a person with some of the uh, from an IT perspective, I see people coming in with some of the IT basics and automation coming in. They don't have any IT basics. They just have the groundwork from either their from their engineering degree and that's it. Right. And that's what, and I mean, that's what you're speaking to when you're seeing communication is you have essentially people t- speaking two languages and you, you have to, you have to get them to, uh, to be able to talk together and you got to close the gap on both ends. Is, is that correct? Yes, you do have to close the gap. And like I say, uh, to being able to understand how the systems work and being able to figure out how, how does this data get from A to B and what am I trying to do? and effectively communicate that because you do have a lot of people in management or whatever that they're in the manufacturing. They don't necessarily have the IT savvy or information. Now, I would say some of the younger managers are much more IT developed than, say, some of the older ones. And it's just because of how they came up in the industry and where they were at the time and things were being evolved, were evolving in the IT space and automation space. But it, it's definitely an inter- what what I have seen and I think it's still today is you get a person coming out of school in an engineering degree that if they want to go into automation, it's basically an on, on the job training. And that's my advice is just try to get some groundwork in IT, try to be that glue to bridge the automation IT gaps, because that's where that's where we are today. And is, that is getting the data from A to B and you got to be able to bridge both. So, I mean, for the for the engineer out there is listening, Joe, and they want to bridge that gap. Where should they study? Where, where do you see if they invested their time here? This would this would help the most. Any advice on that? Well, I think part of it is, you know, they need to take some IT courses dealing with some of the basic tenets of, you know, Ethernet and how that works in terms of protocols, how the operating system works, how the data is moved, what systems you look at the systems and see, you know, how how does this work? You know, I think A plus certification for just a basic person coming out is important to have. Um, I've also seen where we had, I think at JMU, we had a, um, some classes where we would deal with different operating systems such as Linux and, and uh, Windows and those type of things, learn how they work because they have their part or their, their, their place in the industry depending on what, what you're using them for. So, and, and it's having that broad base understanding. You don't have to be a master or, or an expert at it. You just got to be a jack of all trades. I don't know, if you get to be the jack of all trades, and but not the master of all of them, then I think you'll move forward because today is what we do today. 18 months down the road may be totally different or maybe so skewed that, you know, things you did today, you're not going to do down the road. Today, we're working in a totally different environment than we were six months ago. That's right. And I mean, that can, well, that's a great segue to my next question about the future. You know, when you look out and you see this technology, the stuff that's changing, what gets you the most excited? Well, the things that excite me is before, and this is years ago, we would have systems that were running that that supported manufacture, whatever. Always those things would have either a problem or we have to go in and manage. What, What excites me a lot is being able to go home go to bed at night and have the assurance that nothing's going to call me up at 2 a.m. in the morning to tell me that I got a problem. The systems are much more stable today than they were years ago. And when you put something in a lot, it works, you know, and that, and, and also the other thing that really excites me is when you develop some new, may not be developing a new process, but you're developing a new way to get something to work. I mean, I like say when I'm talking about when I was a chemist, being able to get that data uh, electronically and get that batch report versus having to hand calculate it 
that that was a real big thing for me because it uh, not only did it save us time, but it was to me it was an accomplishment to say, hey, things like this can be done. It, you know, it's not something that can't be. It it can be. You have to put some work into it, but there there are things that you can say, hey, you know, I did accomplish something here. Right. Absolutely. I mean, it, it sounds like that you you mentioned that project a few times. So is that would that be a highlight for you? In the beginning of my career, it was a highlight for me because that was the first time I'd ever did something like that. So, Joe, I mean, it sounds like reliability, you were talking about the stability, assurance, and, and just the pass of integration are, are, were so important to you. You know, th- yeah. that, that type of stuff really gets you excited. And as you mentioned, that project, you know, when you first got started, that, that just sounds like something you can hang your hat back on and look back and, and feel really good about what was accomplished there. So thank you for sharing those stories with us for sure. I, I, I'd like to ask you this question. The moment where you're enjoying what you're doing the most and you're, you're getting the most fulfillment, you're at that point of joy and, at work, and I, I hope that you find some joy at work. I, you've been doing it for a long time. I'm sure you impacted a lot of people. What are you doing? What do you find that you're, that you're doing at those moments where you're really enjoying things the most? Like, say, I was in Ireland here. I was actually in February, and I was at our one of our sister sites helping them with a uh, manufacturing system installation and i've been doing these on a number of different sites and one of the automation guys that was there he he asked me he says i don't see this at other places he said, nobody at this entire facility or even in any of our facilities can do what you do he says and also at the level that you are where where do you how did you get to be where you are today because we just don't have that type of knowledge show up here at the site. And I thought that was, that was a compliment to me, but in, I kind of felt like, Hey, that I'm making a difference here for helping these guys out. And that really, I really enjoyed that because all of those are good guys to work with. They wanted to learn, they wanted to understand, and they really took to heart what was going on and how, how it worked. So, and that really, I really enjoyed that. That's great. Thank you for, for sharing. So how often do you go to Ireland? I mean, is that a, you have to go there pretty regular and you've mentioned it a couple of times. No, I don't go where regular and not going at all now, but like say that's, I've been there three or four times in the past two years for various projects and stuff. I got you. Okay. Well, I mean, we also love these episodes, Joe, just to talk a little bit about things outside of career and our work. So any hobbies, anything you enjoy doing outside of Merck? I know at the house here that I've got a lot of projects at the house that I enjoy doing just being whether it's, you know, keeping the place up and and I've got jet ski. I like going to the lake. I like going to the beach. I like doing those things. Um, you know, I do like to travel. I mean, I think even work has afforded me the ability to do some of my hobby in terms of traveling, seeing different places, seeing different people, seeing how different cultures work and, and actually not just doing the tourist type thing, but actually going into a a facility, working with the people side by side and seeing how they live every day and what they deal with. And that, that's a real insight to what, you know, what I don't, you wouldn't see if as a tourist or whatever. Right. Now, so what would be, uh, if you had to name your top two places you've traveled so far, where, where would they be? Italy is one that I really liked. And I think Ireland is the next one. I do like that country. Um, um, Italy was just the differences in how the places you can visit, the people you can talk to people were nice there and you know there's a language barrier there somewhat but and then then in ireland there's no language barrier everybody's extremely nice and um you know a lot of good things there most people seem to be wanting to do the right thing and want to do be happy doing it right right now from a from a travel standpoint where's uh what's on your bucket list where do you want to go i was hoping to go to new zealand but I, uh, that one didn't work out. We have a plant site in New Zealand, but that one didn't work out. I would like to, well, would have liked to have gone there, but like I say, that would be on the bucket list or Australia. 
I bet. I bet. Sounds like some fun places uh, on your list for sure. And Joe, we also love to just give a, a chance to, to tell about our families and what's what, what do you have going on there. So anything you'd like to share with our listeners? Yeah, our families are relatively big. I've got two uh, a stepdaughter and a stepson, and they've got both of them got kids and got three can't actually six grandkids all the way from three years old all the way up to 18. So I got the full gambit and it's never a dull moment when everybody's together. So we're always doing something and um, that keeps you busy and keeps you occupied and keeps you young. That's right. That's right. So are, are most of them uh, around the area? Do you get to get to see each other yes. pretty regularly? pretty much every week so that's the nice thing oh wow that's awesome i bet those grandkids like that jet ski don't they yeah the older ones do the young ones are too scared of it <laughs> <laughs> oh, sounds like a lot of fun out on the lakes so that's yeah. that's great and joe we we love to to wrap these eco ask why episodes up with the why and you know you've done some just tremendous things in your career inspiration i'm sure you've you've mentored a lot of people and helped them along their path so i'd like to know your personal why you know what what drives you what 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 would that be well i always try to do you know try to help people and i look at you know my dad was a mentor to me and how he lived his life and you know my dad at, at 18 he entered world war ii I think within a year, he was a prisoner of war. And you would think after he came from the European theater that he was done. But no, he went to Camp Waters, Texas, training people to hit the beach of Japan. And you think about that, and it's like, you know, he did all this stuff at such a young age, you know, and then and trying to help people and trying to do the right thing. I remember when my mom, she had a stroke. He was there with her every day for a year or more until he got sick. And even, and he's in his mid eighties at that time, you know, late eighties at that time. So his entire life, that's, you know, he was always there, you know, helping people. So that's what inspired me. Wow, Joe. I mean, that's thank you for sharing that. I mean, thank your your dad for the service he provided our country, and and from what I'm hearing, that that servant leadership and and just serving others is so important to you. Uh, it's come through, and that's why you've had the impact you've had in your career on so many people. So, thank you for for being on the show and walking us through this. It's been a wonderful conversation. I'm sure our listeners have enjoyed it and, and picked up a lot and. You've definitely inspired, you know, a lot of people here today, Joe. So thank you so much for, for your time. All right. Thank you. Thank you for listening to Eco Ask Why. This show is supported ad-free by Electrical Equipment Company. Eco is redefining the expectations of an electrical distributor by placing people and ideas before products. Please subscribe and share with your colleagues and friends. Also, leave comments, feedback, and any new topics that you would like to hear. To learn more or to share your insights, visit ecosy.com. That's E E C O A S K S W H Y.com. <laughs>